Heavy Metal Rock. Global Mind. so excited wow can... well done <laughs> well, but i'm old because technology isn't really my thing greg oh, God. Tell um, me about it. But, yeah. <laughs> but thank you for coming to me to stay obviously this is greg hart from the wonderful cats in space um this is an interview for my global mind magazine and talking of technology and age i feel that cats in space have really given us um some old school rock with a contemporary twist. And when I came to see you, the only time I've met you was at um, Painton when you played That's recently. Right. Um, I mean, we met very briefly afterwards and we had such a good time. It was such a brilliant venue, such a brilliant gig. And with everything going on in the world at the moment, it was like a lovely, warm, comforting <laughs> blanket to me. <laughs> That's, That's a nice thing to say. It's just so much joy. I think I, I wrote a review, and in my review, I wrote Cats in Space landed on our planet in 2015, and they've bought a well needed dose of 70s classic inspired rock, which has a soup son of flavor of only the tastiest of the best bands running through everything they do. Think Boston and Journey, but with the most definite Britishness to the boot, and you won't be far wrong. Um, you hail originally from East Sussex, and obviously you have your. We want to talk about your tour in a second. Your tour in the UK, but originally from East Sussex, where, funnily enough, my brother lives in Glynde. It's a nice area. I like it very oh, much. Okay. Yeah. And um, do you know Glynde near Lewis? No, actually, I'm in West Sussex, but I'm. West I'm, Sussex, I'm yeah, Sussex. we're in West Sussex. Yeah, but yeah, Lewis is East Sussex, isn't it? You're Horsham, aren't you? Um, yeah, and yeah, you yeah. You founded the band with your drummer, didn't you, Stevie Bacon? Stevie Bacon, yeah, yeah. Um, Long time, nine years ago now, that was. I can't believe t oh. 2015 to me, see, I think it's yesterday, but it's exactly. just so fast, isn't it? It's frightening. Oh, it's mad. It was mad. I mean, we, yeah. I had a, a memory come up on Facebook the other day saying it was nine years ago on the 4th of November that I actually started demoing songs for the first album. I was off to my mate's studio, and that's when I met. Um, well, I was, I was working with Paul Manzi beforehand, but um, our original singer. But he came in to help do these demos. Didn't know what he was going to sound like, what they were going to sound like. But once we'd done it, I then sort of told Stevie about it, and then we got together and put the band together. So very bizarre. Nine years ago this week, you know. So I can't believe it's frightening, isn't it? I, I think yeah. I interviewed. Motley Crue and Alice Cooper, and I think that was sort of seven years ago or something. And it's still in my head, it's so fresh, you know, all these brilliant yeah, people. Yeah. And I think, actually, yeah, it's nearly a decade. But talking of band, band members, what made you choose the rest of the band members? I know you've had a couple of changes in vocalists, haven't you? I mean, I know um, Mark. Yeah, yeah, like um, yeah we, we uh, Paul did three albums with us, and then we, um, and then, uh, uh Damien joined us just as COVID started. We was doing the Atlantis album, so um, but that's the only change we've had really. Um, the oh, when me and Paul had known each other, and in fact, I'd known Damien longer than I'd known Paul because uh, they both played in this seventies show that I was doing right. um, as lead singers. And uh, Paul came into to depth for that one time. I thought, God, he's a good singer. And he was perfect for what I was thinking of doing. But it's a very long-winded thing, this is. But I was writing songs with Mick Wilson from 10CC. Right. And the project, the project originally was just me and Mick literally writing 70s songs for our own benefit. So we wrote Mr Heartache, and then we got Andy Scott from Sweet to sing on it and play some guitar. And I just thought, this is so good. What are we going to do? So Mick was going to have Mr. Heartache for his second solo album. So we just put it to one side. I said, well, let's just write some more stuff, more, because Mr. Heartache was quite a unique song in a funny sort of way. It was super trampy, but it wasn't 
it wasn't very much like Queen and ELO, which is what I wanted to do. So we started writing some more songs. And then Mick went away on tour. So hence why I went into the studio nine years ago to do half of the album. It was going to be me doing stuff. And then Mick was going to co-write some stuff. And uh, Paul Manzi said, I'll come in and do do the singing. I'd love to be involved. And then I just thought, right, who else am I going to get in the band? Obviously, Stevie was going to do drums. He's an amazing drummer. Always wanted to play in a band with Stevie. We've known each other for quite a while. Andy Stewart on keyboards I've been with for 40 years. So, you know, he's an amazing pianist. You know, he's a he's a really wonderful player. So Andy was always going to be the keyboard player. So I thought, well, I've got half the band deal already. Um, but I needed a bass player and another guitar player. So Dean Howard, I've known Dean since he's, he was into POW back in the 80s. So yeah. I've always been friends with Dean. And we always said, oh, we should do a band one day. We should, we'll do something one day. And like all these years later, D then Dean said, I'm up for that. I'm not doing nothing. So Dean came in. And then by pure fluke, I I, need, I knew Jeff only through folklore. Um, we'd known each other but never met each other all through the 80s, all through the 90s. We kind of did this. And we're, me and Jeff are very similar, let's say. So back in the day, we were a bit of a couple of scallywags. No, um, and, yeah, yes, <laughs> we're terrible. Everyone's saying, Do you know that Jeff Brown bloke? I went, No, but I've heard all about him, and you know, it, it was quite, and he was in the suite then. So, um, by pure fluke, and it was a pure fluke, as I started this thing that very week, and I kid you not, that very week, someone messaged me on Facebook and said, um, do you know a guy called Jeff Brown? I went, oh, blimey. I said, I've got to go meet this Jeff Brown guy. You know, all these years later, I said, Jeff Brown, I've not heard of him for years. You know, and they said, oh, would you mind if I gave him your number? Because he's looking for someone to do some gigs over in Germany. Um, he needs a, a, a depth guitar player. And I'm like, "What doing what? He said, oh, it's all glam rock stuff. And oh, well, that's what I used to do. So, so Jeff phones me up and we had this massive conversation about four hours talking about the world, you know. And I said, yeah, I'll come and do this gig with you. It sounds great. And right at the end, I said, um, tell you what I'm doing at the minute. I said, there might be something that you'll be interested in. So I need really strong vocals. And I know you're a lead singer. Would you be interested in playing bass and maybe doing some really good backing vocals on these songs that I'm doing? He went, what's it like? And I said, blah, blah, blah. He went, oh, I'd love to. I don't do anything original anymore. So Jeff came in and was the the sixth member, if you like, and it was very bizarre because um, from day one the band never met each other until we shot the video for Mr Heartache. Until right. that point, they were coming in and out of the various studios, yeah, bit by bit. So nobody met until the day we shot Mr Heartache. That's the first time all six of us were in the room together. And, I was, and we've always said this, it sounds really corny, but it sounds like we'd always been together. Everyone just went, ah, oh, mate. And within uh, a minute, there was this chemistry that was six old boys <laughs> out of control, basically. We just having couldn't be fun. controlled. Having fun. I mean, that, it, it, that leads me nicely on to the next question, because you've got five studio albums now, haven't you? With the newest one, um, <laughs> Kick Out the Sun. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Five yeah. studio albums, a live album, two Christmas singles, and a best of compilation album already, mm. which is pretty amazing mm. since 2015. So you've established yourself already. Um, it seems to me there's no stopping you. You're just on a roll. You're just loving every minute of it. And my question yeah. was, what makes you gel so much and bring so much enthusiasm? Because when I saw you live, you were just having so – I was jealous of not being on the <laughs> because you were having so much fun – and I guess, I don't know, I guess I can just feel it because I'm this, obviously the same age as you, I, I would guess, more or less. And it's that old school gelling, which I don't think you see always with newer bands necessarily. Maybe I'm just biased. I don't know. Um, well, I mean, it's a, we, I think you, you, I've always said this. You, you're very lucky in this business if you meet a bunch of guys that, you get on well with and you can really make magic with. I mean, if you get it once in a career, you're lucky. I mean, I've had it twice. You know, I mean, I've been very fortunate that my previous band, Maritz, we were the same, but this was a long time ago when we were kids, you know. Um, but we had a magic as well. And and I, I never thought I'd get it again. But um, 
because I knew, apart from Jeff, because I knew everybody, it was very easy. You know, I knew how their characters worked. Dean is the most laid back guitar player you'll ever meet on the planet. So there's no, none of this inter guitar rivalry going on. He just says to me, oh no, Greg, you're playing all them Beatles chords. I don't want to do them, you know. So I just do it all. And then he that has this way of playing lead guitar that I can play the same notes as him, but I can't play like him, you know. So we right. have this great compliment. And, you know, then you've got these. The, the thing that was the most spookiest thing of all, which, I've, again, I've said many times, is when we went into rehearsals, because Dean was the one that said, Greg, you've got to take this on the road. I went, no, no. I said, I don't want to go on the road with it. This wasn't – this was me and Mick writing some songs together, Mick Wilson and Greg are, you know, just doing this stuff. And now I've got this band together. And Mick, as you said to me, he said, you should be a band. You know, you need to be out there. Cats in Space needs to be a band. I went, oh, God. So Dean said, let's do some dates. And I went, all these songs weren't written with any idea of playing them live. I mean, some of these songs are really hard to do. You know, we've got like 100 vocals going on and 50 guitars, and they're not easy songs to play live. So I very reluctantly said, well, look, why don't we just have a rehearsal? Everybody learn five of the songs the easiest ones. Um, we was never going to play Great Story Never Told Live because we just didn't know how to do that. So we were going to. That was the only time we had a discussion about using backing tracks because wow. it's such an orchestrated song. Yeah. So we got this rehearsal in the same as the studio, uh, uh, Yellowfish Studios in Lewis. Funny enough, where we um, recorded the album. Ian Capel, our engineer and producer, was down in his um, editing suite on this i think it was a sunday and i said we're coming in to do a rehearsal at the end of the rehearsal come up and have a listen and tell us if you think we're good enough to pull these songs off live so and the six was just had this magic it, it, it I, and the, so much so that when we did i can remember then i wish we'd videoed it because the look on our faces was like of six-year-old kids at christmas we the first thing we attempted to do was too many gods the very first song we said it's not a difficult song to play. It's got some big vocals on it, but let's just have a go at it. And we played the song through in one go. Thank Nobody you. made a mistake, but the weird thing was, I said to the guys, don't worry about the harmonies. Let's just play the song. Paul, just sing, and we'll just jump on and have a sing song, see what we can do. We would sung all the vocals on the album, so we knew where the harmonies were, but we didn't discuss who was going to do what. Thank you. And we automatically went to the exact right harmony. So Paul sang, Jeff sang this one, and I sang the high one. And we went, hey. what just That's happened there? And then um, Andy on the keyboards, he has a vocoder, so he can yeah. up the vocal pads as well. And we just looked around and went, bloody hell. We didn't just do that, did we? And it was <laughs> amazing. And... Uh, at the end, we got Ian Capel up. And of course, as as we were old and a bit deaf, we were playing really loud. <laughs> and he came into the room and nearly fell over at the sheer volume of the band. And at the end, he just said, I, I can't remember the last time I heard a band play live that good. Yeah, you know no. I mean? And I just went, we've got something here really special. So, yeah. And you can't, and was, yeah. yeah. And also the fact that because we we're old and we'd been around the block and we'd seen all the mistakes... We just had, had this rule, said, look, no one get out of your pram about anything. You know, this is meant to be enjoyable. If it's not enjoyable, we don't do it. Yeah. Um, so if anybody's not enjoying something, explain to us why it's not enjoyable and we'll sort it out. But there's, oh, I mean, I can count on one hand how many rows we've had in nine years. And that's I only think, been me and Jeff to be truthful. <laughs> I think, <laughs> me and Jeff like a couple of old women sometimes. It's so similar, yeah. probably. We are very similar, but the thing is, we both wear our hearts on our sleeves, me and Jeff. So, but yeah, even saying that, you know, we we argue for like five minutes and we look around each other and go, "I think rubbish. I can't. I've got the energy to argue anymore." We just laugh, you know. I was just going to say, it's the energy you get to a certain age, and you think you just don't need the crap, the extra crap, you know, if you're no. not going to enjoy yeah. it. It's only about the music. It's only ever about the for the yeah. good of the band. It's not because you know, like when you're young, you fall out with someone because of a girl or something like. Yeah. Like that. It's just, we argue about the music. Dean and Dean and Jeff bicker about the volume on stage sometimes, but that's all sorted. You know, it's just the tiny little things. You know, no, because we love it so much. You know, and we and I think the main thing is if you respect 
the hierarchy which which makes cats in space work if everybody respects how it works mm. there's no need to to argue with it argue. and i think that's the mistake bands make with you know when they're young is that they start off and as things kind of roll along things happen and if you don't have all the rules set in place from day one you can then have rows about oh, i never agreed to that oh, i never did that yeah. Whereas from day one we laid out the, the foundations very firmly and yeah. everybody respects it so yeah you know well, talking of getting together and, and the songs, I was wondering about the songwriting. I mean, you've obviously written m the main amount of the songs. Does everybody get included in the writing now or not really? Um, it's Well, when, when the band started, it was me and Mick Wilson. We, di we did the first three albums and Stevie used to come in and, and offer up some lyrics because Stevie's a great lyricist. He has a great angle on on stuff and and we have a very similar want for how the band should do songs and we don't write songs that everybody else does we like to twist things around and come in from like the mad at us tea party or time bomb or you know we we do come from a weird i mean mitch mick always says to me he said oh can we just write a song that isn't about witches for once you know <laughs> and i like i like all that stuff you know and i like conspiracy theories and you know without being a bit bold i'm not being bullshy but cats in space was mine and Stevie's projects and we yeah. financed it so the reason was I wanted a vehicle for my songwriting and I pay people to do it basically so that the, the bands understand that they're very happy to do it I always say to them if ever you think you've got a song that you think fits Cats in Space's remit push forward and and we'll discuss it but um no one really does because they're too scared about what me and Stevie are doing. I mean, <laughs> if, if the, if the sands have shifted since Damien joined because Damien is such an incredible singer and he sings from the heart that I think it's very important that he has a, a lyrical input into the songs because he he does he, he immerses himself in them. So and and again, he's also a fantastic melody writer. I mean, some of the songs I've given him on the piano, and I said, look. I want to call it this, and I've kind of got a hook line, but I don't know what to do with the verse. It will just come back with this verse, and he did that on on Kickstart the Sun, the actual track. And when hey. I first heard that, I was just like, "Oh my goodness me!" Because I had the chorus but no verse. And then I'll go and write with Stevie, and Stevie will come up with, um, "Oh, I've got some lyrics here." And I go, "What the hell's that?" And he went, "Oh, it's a it's called so and so." I'm like, "That's bonkers! I love it! No one's written a song like that." And then we, he, he says, oh, I've got about 20 verses, you know. So we then we all, all down and, then, and he has some good melody ideas and chord ideas. So it's moved a little bit over the last two albums. Atlantis and Kickstart has been very much... I mean, I, I produced the albums with Ian Capel, so my head is the is the cinematic thing, if you like, but the guys all put their stamp on it. Jeff has, I mean, as Ian Capel says... It sounds like Cats in Space when Jeff puts the bass down because I do the guy bass like right. stuff in the studio. And then Jeff comes in and thunders out his bass and it sounds like Cats, you know. Um, and Dean plays this lovely guitar. You know, it's it's everyone's got their own stamp on it, but it kind of it comes from the fact that you know it, Stevie and myself we we kind of fund the whole thing, so it's and it is a byproduct of what we want to do. So it's kind of our thing. Um, but it's it's it shifts a little bit. I mean, the new album that we're currently writing is me and Stevie are locked away in his studio, and we're doing it from the bootstraps up together. Right. Um, and and it's got, always yeah. the the music that comes first, or do, do the lyrics sometimes come first? Do you sometimes have an idea for a song and lyric wise, or is it just a melting pot of everything? Whatever. Yeah, it can be either or. To be honest, I mean, I. I I'm, I really like the whole process. I find the, the, the writing and recording is the magic. You know, I've always said, I, you know, I much prefer being in the studio than being on the road. I don't mean that dis dissing being on the road, but I just love being in the studio that much because you're, you're going in on in the morning and you don't know what's going to happen that you're going to reveal to the world by 10 o'clock that night. You know, you're, you're inventing something that no one's ever heard before. And that, to me, is an amazing privilege. And yeah. a, and a big buzz so i've gone in there with stevie's lyrics for instance and he's and i said 
let's do a Bernie Taupin, you know, give me yeah. some lyrics and I'll, I'll write to it. Um, and other times I've written a whole song and I thought, I know where I want this to go, but I just can't get what I call a kicker. And sometimes you need a kicker line to to start the song off. Yes. And, and Steve yeah. has done that. Or me and Mick Wilson, when we write together, we literally write with two acoustic guitars facing each other and we write together. We literally, we don't know what the song is going to be. Occasionally we'll have an idea for a song title. Mad Hatter's Tea Party was a song title that I always wanted to write. Yeah. So that was one song that I wanted to write. Like, um, yeah, there's a few of them I could I could name. Uh, Charlie's okay. Ego, Kickstart the Song. Oh, yeah. So it is, it's either or, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I have to talk about... Oh, I'll never, I... never ask a question shortly, by the way. I should <laughs> concise my answers a bit more, perhaps. So apologies. Yeah, Right got to talk about your amazing shows i was blown away in painton and the marvelous stage sets that have been designed now i didn't realize until recently you're a very prolific artist yourself with your wonderful Probably. rock paintings which i love by the way um so you must have had a big hand in designing the stage sets i presume and in will shock. they in the shock. <laughs> and... I really? know everybody. Yeah, I mean, obviously everything that Cats in Space does, everything originates around the cat pod. So whatever you see, you know, our emblem is the cat yes. helmet. Yeah. Pod. Um, so much so that we don't hardly use the Cats in Space name anymore. We just put the cat pod on a beanie hat and it sells, you know. I got yeah. stopped on Sunday by someone who said, oh, Cats in Space. <laughs> they recognised the little t- yeah, genius, well, you know. So once that was designed by Stevie and myself, mainly Stevie, um, I've I, and obviously Andy Kitson does all their artwork, so I, I try to keep my own personal artwork Separate. out of the way of the band because okay. it's otherwise it's the Greg Hart show too much. I mean, I obviously all the album sleeves and all everything is designed by Stevie and myself and Andy Kitson, but when it came to the live show, James Heron put the whole production together. He's a man with a like a well, he's a man possessed, and he. <laughs> He just said to me, if I'm going to do it, can I, I just want to go and do it. I went, you have to run everything by me and Stevie because we are artistically in control, yeah. you know. And he basically ignored us. He just basically said, I'm going to go and do this. And I went, <laughs> oh. so for about two months, I was petrified of what he was going to do. And then one day he showed me the basics of that um, production. Yeah. And I'm like, fair dues. I would never <laughs> have thought of that. So I, 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 I'm begrudgingly tipping my hat to James Heron, who will be watching this avidly. So, but no, but there's a lot amazing. of James. Because yeah. he's very you... talented. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, very I talented. mean, I walked in and I thought, I think I was having a bit of a, you know, rum do that weekend. I've forgotten what I was doing. I think I just had a jab and I felt a bit rubbish and <laughs> yeah. stuff was going on. And I walked in and straight away I thought. Oh, brilliant. That's really cheered me up already, you know, before you even came and say, where did the name come mm. from, Cats in Space? Oh, that's just, um, God, I've documented that a few times. Um, we just sat in a pub. We, we'd been around to see um, our distributor who was going to distribute the, the album. Yeah. I think, we, I think we was a bit ahead of ourselves because the album wasn't even done, but, and we didn't, and we didn't have a name. And all we didn't want was a, was a, a name that was like every other rock band, like Excalibur or, you <laughs> yeah. know, Black Swans or, you know, and there's loads of bands out there with like Black and Sons and Guns yeah. and Whiskey. And, and, and I just thought, oh, we wanted something ridiculous. But, but people would remember, we just sat in the pub and we both, all of us love cats. So I just lost my cat, TC, and Stevie had just lost his cat. And we sat in there in the pub and, we said something about cats and cats up there in space looking down on us, looking on and cool cats, you know, like back in the sips, like, hey, cool cat, you know. So cool cat, yeah. Spanked. And he said, we said cats in space. I thought, oh, my God, that is, that's so mental. It might just be the name. And I said, well, people either love it or hate it. Yeah. That's for sure. And it yeah. kind of stuck. And I, for a while, I wanted to try and change it. There was a brief period where we said, We'll come up with something else. Let's call it Cat's in Space. And everyone we spoke to loved it. Love, yeah. 
The only people that don't like it are people like Planet Rock and things like that because it's not it's cool, not... you know, but everybody else loves the name. Yeah, but it and is cool. It's a great name. Yeah. Know? And, and what, what's in a name? I've always said this, what's in a name? You know, he said, oh, your name was a bit daft. I went, okay, those damn crows, daft name, Def Leppard, Led Zeppelin, Queen. Yeah. They're all stupid, they're all stupid names until they become famous. Oh, your and, thing, then, you know? yeah. Yeah. and then people go, oh, yeah. Um, and I said, anyway, people call, will call us cats. They'll abbreviate it to cats eventually, and they do. Yeah. And I said, how cool would that be? We actually, at one point about three years ago, we toyed with the idea of just calling ourselves cats and taking the, the space bit out, but we bottled it in the end. Yeah. And it was a no, it's it's it was cat's space. It's, my f- what, my fr- people don't like it. I don't give a stuff no I, 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 but you always remember cats in space you remember it and my my i'm freelance pr in my other life and i, I said to my husband well i'm going freelance what should i call myself and he went how about rabbit attack i went yeah all right <laughs> I mean, rabbit attack. my Brilliant. my my rabbit rabbit attack pr is my freelance name oh, wow. so for a long time when i first started i was getting really dodgy email requests i think people were thinking of Anne Summers. And rabbit, and I was getting some, <laughs> getting some very, very up in the shelf. Yeah, very. Rabbit, and I, I like it. Yeah, I thought, shall I change it? I thought, no, I'm not changing it. People, like you say, people remember it straight away. Yeah, so, Dragon Attack Queen. That's a track off of the game. Yeah, so that's what I thought yeah. when you said it. I thought, oh, yeah, Dragon Attack, great, Rabbit Attack, Rabbit Attack. I would have had the band name as that if I'd have known that <laughs> nine years ago. That's a great name. I could see the twit like the years, and like a. A bomb, and yeah. a bomb with two ears coming out. There you go. Yeah. See, so we've both got cool names, haven't we? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Cats chase rabbits. <laughs> you... <laughs> no, probably don't actually. Dogs chase rabbits, don't they? Yeah. Dogs chase rabbits. Um, you've toured with many amazing bands, including Deep Purple, Status Quo, and Thunder. What are your most memorable stories from those tours that you can that you can talk about that you okay. won't get arrested? Oh, there's, do you know what? None of none of those lot of bad news. They're they're all good boys. Um, the the funny, well, Thunder was the first big tour we did, and obviously, you know, we know Danny and the guys. You know, Dean was at school with them, so we've known them. But you know, everyone thought, oh yeah, you you, you blagged onto that tour because you know, and blah blah blah. But it wasn't like that at all. It had to go through the proper channels. You know? mm. Um, and and they're, yeah, they're just great guys. So the Thunder tour was brilliant fun um every night was just fantastic you know the, the in fact most of the cats fans came from the thunder tour if truth be known we picked up a lot of fans off of that tour because as danny said you know he went our lot of very forgiven i said oh, to their thunder fans i mean thunder fans are thunder fans yeah. and they don't want anybody else he said they'll give you a fair crack mate if you're any good um and we were we were very good so we we did well there uh, um the Quo Tour, I've got to say the Quo Tour is my favourite tour out of all of them because Francis Rossi was just brilliant. He was just a brilliant guy. He was on the st- he was on my side of the stage a lot because his guitar, um, all his guitar workstation was on my side. Mm. And they were such nice fellas. Um, we had to, the, the best story is, because it was the first tour after Rick died, so there was a little bit of tentativeness going on because... Yeah. There's a yeah, there's a bit of business going on there. So we was told be on your best behaviour. You know, it's it's tricky. It's it's a tough yeah. one with Rick going and just mind your p's and q's. Keep out of the way. Don't go into the catering too early. Wait for your turn and all that kind of stuff that you do. Yeah. Play by the way. And then the first thing we saw in there was Francis Rossi having a bowl of soup. Going, oh no, not another lot turn up. Oh god. Uh, and he thought we we're like going to be an like Iron Maiden. You know, and it's really really funny. We thought, oh, he's a get you know and then um he he came in on the second day and um the band were watching a sound check and they went we've had your cd in the in the in the bus he said we thought they're gonna be like my maiden and said all of a sudden these beautiful vocal harps come out and and Ross went, yeah yeah you're far, far too good you won't be talking with us again yeah you're way too good so <laughs> we don't like that you know and then um on the second night um where the Richie, the guitar player, had all his guitars. That was Rick Parfit's guitar station, basically. Yeah. That's where he was. And the guy said, look, rather than you bring all your stuff in, just put your guitars in our 
there's there's enough room in the rack for your guitars. I said, putting my guitars in the hallowed rack that Rick Parfit's guitars went in. He went, oh, don't worry about that. And we just got on famously talking about guitars and stuff oh. like that. And my guitars were lined up because I was standing where Rick would have stood, you know, every That's night kind of thing. Yeah. So that was a real, like, wow, this lot are really cool. And then, yeah, me and Francis started talking about Coronation Street and started jamming <laughs> the Coronation Street theme on his guitar. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my favourite story. Oh, they were in Coronation Street, and I'm a Corrie fan, so yeah, it was, they, were, they were so cool. I mean, welcoming. I, I love. I love and they probably knew that you would be nervous because it was just after Rick that the next it tour. Was, it was a very it was a weird theme. time. Yeah, Be even they had to win the fans over because it was meant to be an acoustic tour, and they switched it to electric and. It, it was a, yeah, it was a it was a, a funny time. So we were really on the back foot Very. thinking we'd done Thunder, we'd done Hyde Park with Phil Collins and Blondie, you know, we we were on a roll. So we we were confident, but you we we should really be on your best behaviour because they might be a bit funny, but they were anything but in fact you could see how much they were enjoyed doing that tour, you know. Well, they were brilliant. They probably needed you guys because you're so joyful. Actually, you're probably the best guys for that tour because you do mm. make people smile. You do make people happy. And not all bands, okay. to be honest, do that, do they? So, no, I guess so. They get a bit up their own asses and they start going around thinking they're, you know, Led Zeppelin or whatever. But we don't do that because we no. don't. I mean, we're the same age as some of these people. You know, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. You've got an amazing set list. At your gig, how on earth do you choose which ones to play, which songs to play? Um, it's, oh, it's always a tough one. That it's there's a core set that we have to do. Mm. Um, we don't want to just rely on all the old stuff and then just pop it a new few new ones in. Um, oh, it's this it's tough. I mean, because the, the the problem we have, which is my fault, is that every album has two epics on it. Yeah. And people love epic so we, we end up doing like five epics in a set and it exhausts people so you although people oh you didn't do so and so like broken wing front people are always going on about why don't we do broken wing it's such a long song that if we put that in it's got to be the expense of something like fill out lovely rock and roll or which we can't ever can't do that you know? um there's so many so you have to kind of ebb and flow the set and, yeah. and it's it, it's getting harder and harder with each album so Kickstart the Sun. The reason we did the tour, we're doing the tour the way we are, is because we thought, well, let's go and trot out all these songs in full once. So maybe people will then forgive us if we have to drop loads of them for the next tour because we did want to play all the songs. So yeah. we said, let's do two sets. You know, that's the whole reason we did it because we can't drop too many God's Greatest Story and, right. you know, Mad Hat's Tea Party, Thunder in the Night. You know, we have to do those songs because people love them. Mm. Um, in, you know, and all the fans say, oh, why don't you do two nights where you do that one night? It's like, we, we, we kill ourselves. You know, <laughs> Damien, bless him, his voice, he's, Damien's got a very strong and safe voice. You know, he very rarely loses his voice, but even he's been saying to me, he said, this is a bit too hard. You know, yeah. we've got four gigs on the spin in December. That's going to be very tough. Yeah, I mean, that so was my next tough, question. Yeah. Well, about your next gigs, you've got, you're still continuing your UK tour. You've still got more in this month. In December and yeah. also in March, I believe. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The two in March are to replace the two that we lost because of the blooming oh, concrete well, situation. Right. Yeah, yeah. So what, I mean, you've played places with real character. Um, what made you choose them? I mean, with, with the next UK tour, will you look at different venues? Will you, will you be looking yeah, at so. bigger venues? Um, I don't know if they'd be bigger. I think what we have to, I mean, obviously this is, so we got to discuss, but we we've made a rod for our back by putting this production on that has to go into a certain size theatre. There's some that we can't do it on. Um, we can't do it at the Brook because it just hasn't got the stage depth, and we need the depth of stage as much as the width. Um, but the short answer is, it's so tough out there in the, in Igland. It's so tough that so many bands are floundering because people just aren't going to support gigs anymore um and a lot of that is down unfortunately to the clubs because they just have too much going on there's too many tribute bands it's, it's just a wash with it and you can't get people to the into the building so we said 
why don't we just go sod this let's put a production together put it into bigger venues we're not expecting to fill the venues that'd be mad to think that but just be seen as putting on a production because people are more likely to want to go and see a bit more of a spectacle rather than just another gig in a black rock club you know so we're looking at venues that can cater for that that aren't too big and next year we'll look at the ones carefully to see which ones worked which ones didn't work and we'll obviously go where the money is you know because obviously if a gig wasn't that well attended we can't afford to go back but it's a building process even at our age it's a building process you know you have to theater land takes a good two three goes before people see you as an established theater show but that's we're not a theater show but we just play a rock show in theatres and there is a big difference and people need to understand that, that yeah. just because we're in a theatre doesn't mean to say we're going to do Pete's Dragon. You know, it's it's a rock band in a theatre. That's all it is. Um, so it's, it's yeah, it's a, it's a fine balancing act between what we can achieve and what we can't achieve yeah. for the next tour. You know, we might look at doing it a little bit different. Very unlikely we'll do two sets again. It'll probably be a one-set show with a, a support band. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because we don't feel the need to go out and do kickstart the sun in its entirety again. So um, we'll review it. So when, so you think you will be touring next year? Um, yeah, the plan will be to tour. We've got the two dates in March anyway, which you've got to do. Yeah. We've yeah. got a, a couple of, um, ooh, what have we got? There's a couple of festivals that we're, we're discussing okay. next year. Um, indoor ones um and we'll be looking to tour again at the back end of the year we've 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 got um the next studio album to do first so obviously if we do the studio album it comes out when we want it to come out we'll tour to support the next album of course so um it's going to be a very hectic year to get it all done because also we're recording this tour for a live album oh are you oh so so we're when will the live album be released for this one? That's the million dollar question. I mean, okay. it's, it's, it's <laughs> the, depending how the tracks come out, um, we will have to mix it and get it out a bit sharpish because otherwise it will clap into the studio album, which would be a bit mad. But I've always said that we're, we kind of, we're a bit like Kiss. We're back in the 70s, they were releasing albums every eight months and churning out stuff left, right, and centre. We're only doing it. We we we've got such a workload because I said we're you know we're running out of time. You know we haven't got the luxury of sitting around for four years in between albums. You know we we've got a lot to say, a lot to get out before we retire. So there could be two albums out next year. Yay! Brilliant. You know? Yeah. Why not? You know it's that just. Was... I mean, yeah. I mean, a live album is it's always going to be a bit of a stopgap anyway. Most bands that do live albums, their contracts obligations. Yeah. And then you find that they do the next year album with a different lineup or whatever, you know, have the Thin Lizzy, you know, yeah. to those people, you know. So um historically they don't sell as well as a studio album. So we're treating the live album as a document of what we've done with Kickstart the Sun. Um, yeah. put a put a block in it and then move on to the next thing. We've we've got all the plans in place for the next album. Me and Steve, we've already got the title, we've got most of the songs written. We've demoed half of them. Right. We're always, we're, whenever you see Cats in Space on tour, feel sorry for us because behind <laughs> the scenes, we're yeah. ahead of the tour and we're already working on the next working album. The next and day. that's how it's always worked. From day one, when we did the Too Many Gods tour, we were already recording Scarecrow. And when we did Scarecrow, yeah. we were already looking at Narnia. You know, it was we we're always... Because that's how it rolls over for the next year. You know, yeah. you have to be... Yeah, you have to. Yeah. Because of the vi- it's mainly because of the vinyl production. You know, in the old days, you could go in, do a tour, write for a month, then the record company could get the vinyl out within a couple of weeks. You know, yeah. nowadays you have to plan six to eight months ahead for the vinyl to be manufactured. Because there's so, less people that are, can produce it for you. But yeah. even though it's yeah, a growing, but now yeah. there's more demand, isn't there? Again, so it's yeah, growing. It's growing again, and also, and it's, and unfortunately, it's growing faster than they can make the machinery because they got, most of the machinery got continued, continued in the nineties, so they, they off, all the machines went out to weird countries, you know, around the world. It's it's crazy, and of course, then you get Taylor Swift comes out and wants her new album pressed on eight different colours. She clogs up the machines. 
yeah you know, and that's what happened during covid when we did the when we did kickstart they mm. were clogged up doing abba taylor swift ed sheeran adele and once those machines are clogged up doing the major label stuff you're just pushed I, back i didn't even think about that side of it mm. it's tough there's a company in the uk now that have opened up which i keep getting told about so i might talk to them but um, it all comes down to the lead times, you know. But generally speaking, if we finish an album, you know, say in January, and then we master it and and get it all ready in February, and then yeah. you send it off to be made, the CDs will come back in four to six weeks, no problem. Yeah. The vinyl they might give you a summer. So although your album's finished in January, you can't really get a, a campaign going till September. How frustrating is that? That's really. really? Wouldn't it yes. be lovely to have it pressed in the UK, to have it all UK? That would be if really... Can, yeah. If they, well, if they don't get too busy, because obviously the more people go there, they're going to get trucker as well. So um, I'm going to I'm going to talk to a few people about the next album, whether that might be a possibility. The trouble is where we go, the company we use uh, in Europe, they do oh, all the major stuff like Queen and stuff like that. And the quality is phenomenal. And uh, I'm very, I'm a bit of a thick. If you're going to do it on vinyl, it's not for us. It's not a um, a vanity piece. You know, our, our albums aren't designed to be left in the shrink wrap and put it put on the shelf. They're meant to be played because they're sonically mixed for vinyl. You know, we do actually mix for vinyl. And mm -hmm. I, I always say the vinyl has a superior edge to a CD. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, Definitely. there's a, there's something about it, so we have to make sure it's right. So it's not a case of oh, long as it looks good, it doesn't matter. No, it has to sound good, so that's important. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks for that. Um, okay, right. What's my next question? Right, this can be quite hard actually for you. Which are your top three cats tracks and why? Which are your favourite three tracks? Oh, I like that. That's a good question. Um. I can put a smoke on the answer now. <laughs> um, oh, it's a, it is, it's a tough, it's like trying to choose your favourite cat, you know, but I'd, I'd have to say I uh, fell out of love with rock and roll. Oh, yeah, that's good. That has to be, there's, there's many reasons why that's um, there in the top three. One, because I wrote it in about five minutes. It's, I know. Mean, kid you not it's a i had an elton john moment where i sat down at the piano and i don't know what happened i was listening to something or whatever and i just went i fell out of love with rock and roll quite a good title and i just immediately thought of mock the hoop all and queen and i just sat down at the piano and i thought, and I thought right now i very rarely do this but what i decided to do was play a song that you don't know what it is but just play a chord progression that is the most traditional anyone's heard it before um piano and just see what happens so mate as so i was what i did i tried to make out that i was singing or badly somebody else's song right and i just went I love you, I love you, black fool got fed up with the you know that kind of frank sinatra thing i just started and all those chords went ding dang ding dang ding dang ding yeah there's the bridge yeah oh, that's traditional yeah do that oh I'll always go to the freddy chord there yeah did that bang and that's why i fell out love with rock and roll Right, repeat, did, it, did, it, did that again. Didn't have all the words down, but I had the whole melody and, and the hook lines. And then I immediately thought, well, you're going to go to mid late now. And it all comes back to zero. And I just went, can't reinvent the wheel. I'm like, bloody hell. And I try to write this stuff down. And it literally, uh, even with all the lyrics, apart from I changed one line about a month later, I changed the got fed up with the... Oh no! I can't. It, I think it was got filled up with the hair a lot. One of the first lines I I changed, but apart from that, I wrote it down in one it, and oh. even the mid late bit um, with the solo. And then I started hearing trumpets. I started hearing the Beatles. So all that stuff came into play, and I just thought, I know I've nicked someone else's song here because that can't be. I can't have invented that. It's obviously someone else's. Re re recorded the piano on my phone. Went into the studio of Ian Cable and said, I've got this idea for a song. And he went, you're writing a classic. Yeah. Like, yeah. But what is it? He went, I don't know. I said, what, what is this song? It can't be ours. you know. <laughs> and we just did it. And after, after about two hours of demoing, I went, 
this is the best song I've ever it's written. A classic, yes. <laughs> and and it's come from the heart, and it's actually it's actually something about me. You know, it's actually a, a genuine lyric that is fancy. So that so that's a big song. Bootleg Bandoleros, without question, is oh the, yeah, that's the most accomplished song. And again, it's got a great twist because Bootleg Bandoleros was originally King of Stars. And I didn't have any lyrics for this idea that I had. So Stevie, I said, oh, I've got this idea for a song. All I can hear is... Da, 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 da. And I said, I've got a horrible feeling that it's, it needs to be this other song. So he sent me these lyrics through. And he hadn't heard the song. He just sent me some words through. And I went, oh, my God, these metre exactly how I want them to metre for this idea. Mm. I don't know what happened there, and I just so we worked on it, and I, and they're the, I mean his lyrics are phenomenal, tape to tape and rust to rust, bootleg bandoleros we trust. I mean it's just high drama on the high seas, you know. Yeah. So that that is without a question the most accomplished song that um, I've ever been part of. But Steve is a big part of that as well, and it took us a long time to do the song, but it's. I call it it's one of those songs that almost produced itself because you knew what had to happen. Right. Albeit a lot had to happen. And even the bit in the middle, there's an instrumental version on the bonus CD where we, you can hear before the solo, there's all these sound effects of this fight breaking out on the boat that Andy <laughs> Stewart did and guns going off and seagulls squawking and that. And it's just, <laughs> I said, this needs to be in a film, you know? So that's a, that's a big song. Um, Oh God, there's so many. There's so many. Okay. It's a hard one, isn't it? I mean, greatest story never told. Yeah, is very special to me because Mike Moran orchestrated it. It was the first time that me and Mick really got our teeth into a big song, you know, a proper big song. Um, and it took a lot of work to get that where it was. And, and Mick's a brilliant lyricist um, and a fantastic writer. And that, I think that song was the one that really cemented us together as a really strong writing team yeah. and after that i mean stuff like september rain which we unfortunately we very rarely play now that's a that's a mix song that's lyrics about him um and i have music so that's one where he wrote to my music which is a nice thing whereas we normally would do it all together um to see i mean oh god uh, uh, and i've got to say the actual title track kickstart the sun yeah, it's fabulous. Yeah. Because it's got the Glen Campbell bit in the middle and it's got, yeah. and Daniel, you know, his voice. He's great. Just, and and his humour as well. His humour with the crowd <laughs> is very, yeah, it's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Because a lot, again, a lot of singers just don't, they don't do that. Yeah. They interact and it's, and your, your fans, I mean, I was really, they are diehard. I mean, I met fans in the day. <laughs> We were doing our makeup and they were saying, Yeah, we've come down from so and so to see them and yeah, we follow them around. And I thought, how cool is that? How often do you see that? When I go and see old bands like Enough's Enough or obviously Motley Crew, I was at, and you get people that do that for those bands. But for you guys mm. that haven't have only been established since 2015, I think it's quite unusual to have diehard fans like that already. So it's it's it a seems, yeah. You know, and and you 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 reap what you sow, don't you? I mean, yeah, we tap into it, and we give them the ultimate respect because in this day and age, you need your fans. You have to be transparent. There's none of this kind of Led Zeppelin thing where it's us and them. You know, you have to be accessible. Um, and if you make yourself accessible, you make people's day. You know, some of these people yeah. they take what we do extremely seriously. Yes. You know, really. Well, when. And, the and, end... and we could be flippant, but they're not. You know, I sometimes I'm, 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 you know, always underselling stuff. You know, not not when I'm promoting, but I'm quite, I'm quite flippant with what we do sometimes because sometimes we don't value it quite the same way, maybe. But these people, we really do mean a lot to them. You know, yeah. and and also we got a lot of fans that they're at an age now where they're starting to value things more because. You know, we've seen fans, some of our Uber fans, unfortunately, have passed away since we've been going. And mm. it really uh, breaks your heart to see. I thought, oh, my God, that guy collected all our stuff. He was at all our VIP events. He was at front row of every gig. And he's no longer here. So people are very 
mindful of what they're doing now, you know. And that's why I'm saying about a gig needs to be an experience Mm. because if people are going to make the effort and we are getting older, we don't all want to go out and stand up in a sticky floor club for eight hours being bludgeoned to death. You know, so we think, let's give them a memory. Let's go to Milton Keynes, the stables. It's one of the best venues in the world, as far as I'm concerned. We've all played all over the place. And the Milton Keynes stables is one of the greatest venues. It's not massive. It's just this unique place. I said, if you get the chance, make a day out, make a memory and go to the stables because you will absolutely fall in love with it there. And people do. And we want more people to do that because... They go home and they it becomes like all oh, stables or oh, it's all about stable. You know, it, you make something special. So yeah. we're very mindful of that. And our fans are very, very loyal. They're very well, when, dedicated. When you them. came out after the gig and they and the fans were all waiting, you were so I've very rarely seen many bands that were so warm with their fans. It it, it was like meeting old friends. You were great you were yeah. great. And it, I mean, some of, these, yeah, some, of these, some of these people have paid an awful lot of money over the years mm. buying everything that we do. I mean, we're not talking hundreds of quid. We're talking thousands and thousands yeah. of pounds. One, you know, these individual people are spending. They deserve the utmost respect, you know. And, we, you know, some of the lucky ones were able to come into the studio with us and watch us record. Really? Come to VIP. Yeah, I mean, OK, it, it's not affordable for everybody. We understand that. But we are a business at the end of the day. Yeah. And we have to do these yeah. things to help fund what we do. You know, we don't we won't go to crowdfunding and all this old nonsense. We do it ourselves. We do yeah. our own our own form of funding. And we say, OK, we're asking a lot of people to do this. What can we make make it worthwhile? You know, I don't know. Get them on the album, clapping and stomping their feet. They didn't know that till they came in the studio. Oh, that's so told, the only law th- that we had when you come into the studio is that you must bring a pair of gloves and a pair of strong boots. They're going, is it that cold down there? You know, what are we doing? I said, don't matter. So when they turned up with their gloves and their boots and stuff like that, they, they didn't know what was doing. I said, right, you're going to stomp your feet and clap your hands in the studio and you're going to be on the next album. Really? <laughs> and if I could have bottled the look on their faces. <laughs> Because that was, they did not expect that to happen. I said, that's why you spent so much money. That's yeah. why we charged you a lot of money. Not being funny, but that's why we did it. Because we said, we're going to give you something you're never going to get again. And they were beside oh, themselves. Oh, that's amazing. But you don't... And we had to limit it as well. We had to limit it. So we had two different studios. The same thing happened in both studios. Oh. And we said, we can't have you both come into this. Because some of them would have come to both. Yeah. And we had to open it up to more people. So we actually had twice the amount of people so you know and so therefore you have to give them respect at the gigs as long as we can do it we'll, we'll do it it's hard sometimes I and mean, i always say the meet and greet afterwards is harder than the gig sometimes because everybody wants a piece of you yeah but you have to remember it's the day when they don't want a piece of you that you want to worry yeah yeah and you don't and you don't charge people for me you know you didn't no, charge people it. for the meet well, and greet no, they, they spend enough they spend hundred pound on merchandise so they yeah. buy 15 beanie hats and pile them on top of their heads or whatever you know why on earth do we want to charge them to have my I don't under- yeah i don't I, understand I mean, that the, the established bands that literally don't need the money charging yeah. I, I personally i might get in trouble but i don't think it's great well it's because uh, they come from the shithead 80s where the band had a, there was a divide there so in, in a way i don't blame them because they come they, they come from a different world they don't know the world of mixing and being transparent with fans, maybe because they come from the eighties when bands are up on a pedestal. Ain't like that now, you know. If Def Leppard are doing meet and greets, it's because they know they're it's where the smart money is. But when you're charging a thousand dollars just to have a photo and you can't talk to the band, you got to move on straight away. I think that's the and go back to your golden ticket. Not saying Def Leppard do that, but I know a few bands that do that. You're not allowed to talk to the band. Well, I know, I know, I, yeah, and I know a few band members, I won't mention any, that refuse to be involved with the meet and greet because of the money they charge. But I won't say yeah. any names, but I do know people that wish I have respect yeah. for. But. Yeah, good on them. No, we, we won't do that. I mean, at the end of the day, where do you draw the line? If if I'm going to charge you $1,000 to see me after a, an arena show, and yet the next day you catch me down at Greg's buying a sausage yeah. <laughs> yeah. have I got to refuse? to sign your bit of paper because you yeah. didn't pay a thousand dollars the night before yeah and, then and it, that puts you in a very awkward position yeah 
But anyway. I, I don't, yeah, yeah, anyway. We, we digress. Do I probably shouldn't even have gone down that rude road. <laughs> no, I think, it's, I think it's valid, really, because at the end of the day, we meet our fans. Order is to it. Without them, we don't have a gig. No. Um, right, OK. Your influences include Queen, Boston, Styx, CLO, Journey. But if you had to pick your ideal festival lineup, dead or alive, you can have like three or four bands, and your perfect person to introduce them on stage, dead or alive, who would it be? Queen with, <laughs> Queen with Freddie. Yeah. Headlining. Yeah. Then Lizzie with Phil. Yeah. Then us. Yeah. Obviously. Kiss can go on before us. <laughs> In their jeans and T-shirts. No, no, no pyro allowed. No, I wouldn't have Kiss, no. I mean, I'd love Kiss, but I wouldn't, know. It'd be, be Queen at the top, Finn Lizzie with Phil. Um, us. And without a question of a doubt, Jellyfish. Jellyfish? Really? Jellyfish. The greatest band that no one knows about. <laughs> But they were born in the wrong time, unfortunately. But um, I, I met Tim Smith at Jellyfish once when we did Mr. Heartache, funny enough. And had I got the timing right, I'd have got him to play bass on the track. But um, he was with Noel Gallagher at the time, um, Flying Birds or whatever they are. Um, yeah. But Jellyfish are just, uh, yeah, I'd give anything, any anything to see Jellyfish play a gig. I'd really? fly to the moon if I, if I had to, to see Jellyfish. Yeah, they're amazing. So that'd be the that'd be the lineup, and I'd, we'd be introduced by um, Raquel Welsh. Oh, yeah! I don't blame you. She's gorgeous. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that, that's oh, really... actually, or, or Rowan Atkinson. If Rowan Atkinson came on as Blackadder Three, <laughs> see, and he can introduce us. Yeah, that that'd be cool. With Baldrick, he can With be the Baldrick. be the roadie, couldn't he, Baldrick? That'd be cool. <laughs> he could blow things up. My amp yeah. doesn't work. I have a cunning plan how to make your amp work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plug it in. <laughs> yeah. Someone said to me once, said, would, would you ever get starstruck if you met anybody? And I couldn't think of anybody. And after the question, I thought, Rowan Atkinson. Really? He'd, he'd be probably the one person I'd be, I'd be starstruck, yeah. He's quite Love a it. serious chap, isn't he, in real life, when he's mm. been quite a sick but then a lot of comedians are aren't they yeah yeah oh yeah very much so yeah i mean um, i saw rowan's first tour in 1980 right rowan atkinson in review with howard goodall yeah i saw that at the fairfield halls in croydon yeah. and oh i love, I love rowan atkinson <laughs> love him. just That's love him mm. yeah um right so my last question is and you've probably said it all really oh no there's two two points to this um have you got any hot off the press news well you've already said you're recording an album <laughs> i think it'd be really good to have if you've got the title already i know you can't tell me the title can you tell me one word from the title one no and there's a reason why i can't tell you one word from the title okay or, okay Good. get it that's a good, good I'll, I'll give you one i'll give you one letter go on one from the top three uh, no um e <laughs> Okay. It's got a vowel in it. There you go. <laughs> no, it doesn't begin with that. No, it's um, it's we've had the idea for a long time. Um, and it, it's always been a title we've had kicking around, and it's an obvious thing that Cats should probably do an album, like. But... Not Trey. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, maybe maybe we should call it um, Rabbit Attack. Rabbit Attack. Yeah, go on. A great name, I love it. I really like that. No, it's um, we've got it all planned. Um, we're we've been to see a studio, so we're going to a different studio to record in that's going to be amazing. Um, but I've got you know, there's a lot of hoops to jump through yet, but that's the plan. But it, we're going to be doing it in a slightly different way to what we normally do. Mm. Um, if all goes to plan, the exclusive here will be. Because people have had to watch this now for nearly an hour to get the exclusive. The exclusive will be there could very well be another studio VIP day. <laughs> and the fans the, out there will know what that means. Do they have to bring their boots? Yeah, maybe. No, no, maybe something different next time. Oh. We've got a, I've got a plan. It will be something that will be quite brilliant because they'll they'll witness something 
very unique. Oh, that sounds really... If it goes to plan, I mean, I'm, I'm shooting myself in the foot here because it never happens, I'm going to look like an idiot, but that's the plan because this studio has got a brilliant facility in it for us to be able to do what we, we want to do. Okay. So that so that's the plan. Um, I can't give any dates away yet, but as always, we've got to think that far ahead. So there's that. There's also going to be... An, when's this going out, by the way, this interview? Literally... As soon as I can get it out, because I've just video to the guys after we finish, basically. Oh, okay, brilliant. Okay, well, there's there's a thing coming out on Friday. There's an exclusive coming out this Friday that's going to be in the web store for Christmas. Oh, um, and it's only going to be available until the end of November to pre-order. So that's that's a little cheeky exclusive as well. Oh, thank you. It's not that. Oh, wow. It's not the cat it's not music. It's, it's not, not music. It's it, nothing. It's not a song or anything. It's it's it, a, a classic Cats in Space collectible. The cat helmet. No, that's that. The, the, the raffle for that is being drawn at Swansea Patty Pavilions. Really? The final gig of the tour. That someone's going to win that. Pod. <laughs> it's worth a fortune. I bet. Honestly, we have sold hundreds of raffle tickets, and it's going to charity. So. Yeah, so I mean, it's that's... going to a good cause. Uh, yeah. Oh, right. And there's nothing. That's your two exclusives. As soon yeah. as I, as soon as you know about the um, recording and the VIP, it would be great to know. Then we can have another chat. Possibly. Yeah, absolutely. So if absolutely. You... Yeah. I mean, it's going to be the, the, the thing with the VIP next time. If it goes to pan, I'm, I don't want to shoot myself in the foot. Okay. Last time it was just post COVID. So we were very, very limited with the amount of people we were allowed in the studio, like literally eight people I think was allowed in because there's like the band and the entourage as well so the building itself was limited to 20 people in its entirety oh, okay. makes it very hard this time there's none of that and the studio's got a bigger facility for more people so there could well be the opportunity for uh, a few more people for the VIP yeah brilliant Right, okay. I don't say anymore because it doesn't happen. I'm going to look like I, an idiot. I won't, I won't push you anymore because I hate pushy, pushy press. So, <laughs> come and see the tour. Just come and see the final dates on tour. See the That's final dates on the tour. Um, what we'll do is I'll get the guys on my global mind to put those on there. Yes, please do. One, but all the details will be on there. And I'm going to see how fast we can get this out for you now. Um, and thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you, Fran. It's been an absolute pleasure. Nice yeah. questions. Enjoy oh, it. Yeah, thank you. And hopefully okay. we'll catch up again soon. Defo, yeah. Get, keep, keep in touch. And like I said, when, when we get into the next campaign, let's talk. Super. Thank you so much, Greg. And have a wonderful... No from rabbit attack to cat. <laughs> rabbit attack. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbits to cats. Nice one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Heavy metal rock. Global mind.